Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on season two, episode 25 already. Yes. This episode is entitled Tribunal and it aired June 5th, 1994. Before we dig into this one, anything to talk about from the previous podcast, The Collaborator? No, it was perfect. I haven't listened to it yet because we're recording a little quickly this week and I just haven't had time to get to it. So I'm sure it was perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, most importantly, this is our first recording of 2021. That's true. It is. That might confuse people because by the time this airs, it'll be like February. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be like, what? (laughs) Yeah. We record a little in advance. Yeah. We're trying to get a few in the bank. Yeah. Well, in retrospect, I think our podcast was actually the only good thing that came out of 2020. And I'm sure our our listeners agree. Yeah, that's definitely true. I have no other comment on that topic (laughs) (laughs) because (laughs) 2020 was not great. (laughs) Hopefully by the time this airs in 2021, things are better. Yes. But I guess that remains to be seen. I always look on the positive. Do you? Yes. Remember, I'm the one who always has the positive interpretations of things. That's true. You're much more of a realist. Yes. Well, we are almost at the end of the season. Yeah, only one episode left. Oh, and it's a big one. It's a very important one. Yes. No spoilers. I watched it this morning. Oh, oh, great. I can now give you spoilers. I watched it, but didn't take notes, so I'll have to watch it again. Okay. But okay, should we get into this one? Absolutely. In the cold open, Miles is in civilian clothes, rushing around ops, telling everyone what to watch out for while he's away. His clothes in this scene are practically like normal Earth clothes with a royal blue shirt and gray pants, not the usual weird onesie that people seem to wear (laughs) in the future. Yeah, it does seem like he just rolled up to the set and they're like, yeah, just go on and read your lines. Just go, just go. Yeah. Dax is rushing around after him, taking note of everything he says. Finally, Kira tells him they'll survive without him for a week and he should go on his vacation and get out of their hair. That finally gets him to the elevator. This scene proves Miles is incapable of delegating. Oh, yeah, for sure. And Sisko comes out of his office asking if he's gone yet, just as Miles comes back up to tell him something else that he forgot. And Sisko says, Chief, You are on leave. Please disembark the station. (laughs) He missed a chance to say, you're on leave. Please leave. (laughs) I can't believe he didn't say that. Well, he's not a very punny man. Well, you know that he's in for trouble because he's too happy and they spent way too much time on this scene of him getting ready to leave. Oh, a lot of ominous overtones there. Definitely. He's happy. He's about to leave. Now out on the promenade, he is rushing and he bumps into someone that he served with on the Rutledge. They have a quick reunion where Miles reminds him of his name and says he's chief engineer on the station now. The guy's very friendly. He says he's been out of Starfleet for eight years and he lives on Volon 3. Miles wonders how he can live in the DMZ after what they went through in the border wars. This guy's name is Boone, and Boone says that's what got him out of Starfleet, but he's mining something the Cardassians need, so they leave him alone. Oh. Then Miles says he has to run because his wife is waiting for him. Boone says he'll be back for a supply pickup in a few months, and Miles runs off. And as he does, Boone's smile fades really quickly. By the way, Boone is wearing, like, a blue turtleneck sweater with a brown and tan vest and green sleeves. I mean, what is with this outfit? This is the ugliest outfit we've had in a while. (laughs) It matches his truly awful moustache. You know somebody (laughs) with a moustache like that is up to no good. Well, this is played by a guy named John Beck. He's a very familiar face from all kinds of TV shows. But I think at this time in the 90s, he's probably best known for being on Dallas. So that moustache makes a lot of sense. Ah, Was he a regular on the show? For a couple of years, I think. Yeah. Okay. At least he was recurring. Yeah. I think it said he had 67 appearances. Wow. Yeah. And so this is our second Dallas person. Yeah, oh yeah. Because we had Who Shot JR or Who Shot Quark a couple episodes ago. <laughs> she did actually, that's true. Next we get some ominous music as Boone enters a dark room and pulls a device out of his pocket where we find that he's recorded Miles saying his name and rank. That's dangerous. Oh uh, yeah. What's funny here is he had to rewind what he recorded. So what, he's got a tape in that little <laughs> box? That was really funny. That's how you did that kind of thing then. Yeah, apparently so. Well anyway, we cue the theme song. Another thing to bring up in this opening scene is I don't think I've ever seen the elevator move that fast before. (laughs) Yeah, I think he might have sped it up on his way out. Yeah. Cisco flipped it into the fast mode just to get rid of Miles. That's pretty funny. I wonder if he did. I wonder if there is a fast mode because usually it's a lot slower. Yep. 
Keiko and Miles are in a runabout, and there's a lot of talk about Miles forgetting the hollow camera. She's not happy that they're on their first vacation in five years, and he brought along technical update manuals to read. (laughs) Then they talk about how they left Molly with the Petersons, and Keiko says she likes the Petersons more than she likes us. That was cute, but this is just a way to tell us that Molly's not on board. Yes, but at the Petersons again, the young girl is practically being brought up by the Petersons. (laughs) Only when there's trouble. Which seems to be all the time. Well, sure, it's Deep Space Nine. (laughs) Well, anyway, it's all holiday bliss, although Keiko gets annoyed that he's not paying attention to her while she rushes around making lunch. I don't know. I personally wouldn't care if you brought tech manuals on vacation. I mean, you should do what makes you happy. I don't know what she was so upset about. But I suppose she also just wants him to disengage from work and unwind a bit for a change. Yeah, he does seem to like kind of live the job. Yeah, he's definitely obsessed. That is more likely to be reversed for us too, though. I don't bring technical manuals along on vacation. No, but work usually comes with you. I might work, yeah. Well... (laughs) In the old days, not so much now. (laughs) I have an awesome picture of you taking a DBA call at the rim of Meteor Crater. Well, when you're the DBA, (laughs) things happen and you have to pay attention to it. I don't have that kind of job anymore where when something goes down, I'm the one who has to fix it. It's not like it used to be. No. Not that we get to go anywhere right now. Oh, well, there is that. Well, I'm going to skip the makeout part here where Keiko asks if the seat reclines because that was awkward and weird. Oh, they were just getting cuddly. (laughs) Yeah. But none of this matters because the real story starts when a Cardassian patrol ship approaches. Gull Evek, who we've seen before, comes on screen telling Miles they're going to board and inspect his ship. Miles points out they aren't near the Cardassian border and he has no right, but that doesn't really matter because they beam on board and arrest him. Because the Cardassians have no recognition of borders, Federation territory. They just do what they want. They do what they want and the Federation lets them. Well, that's for the best. Well, they won't tell him what he's accused of, saying he'll be taken to central prison on Cardassia Prime to await trial. His wife will be returned to the station. He has committed crimes against Cardassian Vols. He has. Miles resists, of course, and they shoot him, knocking him out, and then they beam away, leaving Keiko shouting. Ah. Uh Uh-oh. That's bad. This is not good. Cardassian Vols are a protected species. (laughs) That would be bad. When he was arrested on the shuttle, the Cardassian version of reading him his rights was just hilarious. If you refuse to answer questions, it may be constituted as a sign of guilt. (laughs) Yeah. And it was also like, are you denying that you did this or something? And he's like, I don't even know what it is. Oh, so you are denying it. (laughs) Like, (laughs) wait, what? Yeah, it was not good. Yeah. Now we go to Cardassia Prime and we see a view of a city, which we don't see that often in Star Trek. But anyway, there are big broadcast screens throughout the city of a Cardassian who's speaking and he's saying... Look to the children. They are the future of Cardassia. They will lead the way. It was actually quite difficult to hear that, but the closed captions told me what he was saying. Uh, (laughs) So it's like it's just broadcasting propaganda 24 hours a day. If you notice, the style of Cardassian architecture follows Deep Space Nine, a.k.a. Terek Nor. Yeah, I did notice that. I also noticed that there were zero people in the streets in the city. It was abandoned. I think they showed... A couple of Cardassians on the roof of a building or something. Yeah. It's expensive to do special effects like that in those days. Yeah, for sure. The next part is pretty brutal as they strip Miles under a bright light as he keeps repeating his name and rank. They try to get a confession out of him and they flash a laser in his eyes and force him into a scary looking torture chair where they inject him with something, cut off a lock of his hair and then pull out a tooth, which is very nasty. Although no blood, which come on. (laughs) <laughs> Tooth pulling causes blood. <laughs> they certainly roughed him up a little there. I think this is the normal method of Cardassian processing. Processing, yeah, exactly. Well, then they shine some kind of blue light on him, which seemed to bruise his face. I don't know what that light was about. A Cardassian woman with severe hair. I mean, severe hair. She could have been in the Dilbert episode, Armageddon Game, oh, yeah. a few episodes ago with that crazy hair. Well, I think everything about her spells severe. (laughs) Definitely. They have like turned it up to 11 in terms of her costume and her look and everything. It's quite impressive, actually. She's serious. Yeah. She's serious business. Well, she comes in and she's annoyed to see how Miles looks, saying he wasn't to be harmed. But the other Cardassian says he had to be restrained. They bring him some clothes and stand him up. The woman apologizes to him for how he's been treated. And she says she's Makbar, Chief Archon which seems to be some kind of judge. She's played by Carolyn Lagerfeld, who at this time had been on a number of shows, including multiple soap operas. She also appeared on Spencer for Hire and TJ Hooker. So she's already been on screen with some Starfleet people. I thought that was funny. (laughs) 
<laughs> She's been in all kinds of things, including the movie Minority Report yeah. and also many TV shows like Gossip Girl and Sweet Magnolias. So even kind of recently. It's pretty hard to recognize her under all that makeup and prosthetics. Yeah, I didn't recognize her at all. I had to look up who it was. Well, the Archon walks him to his cell, which is right next to the torture chair, and says she wants his stay here to be as comfortable as possible. Great. She says his trial will start in two days with the venerable Kovat as his public defendant. But still, no one will tell Miles what he's accused of. Then we go back to the station, and Sisko is telling Keiko that Starfleet has ordered a bunch of ships to the border of the DMZ to show the Cardassians that they're risking the treaty. Keiko is sure that Miles is being tortured, and Odo can confirm that that is standard procedure. It does seem to be Keiko is the only one who really understands what's going on. Yes, well, because she's heard it from Miles. I mean, even here she says that Miles has told her in the past what the Cardassians did to prisoners on Setlik 3. Oh, right. And what they yes. were like when they came back. He was disgusted and afraid of that, she says. And here we see the Federation doing that thing again. The Cardassians are violating Federation space, kidnapping yep. Federation citizens, and yep. they're sending some ships there because they're worried about their piece of paper treaty. Yeah, I go back to the first season when someone was trying to take Dax off of the station, and Cisco made a whole big deal about how you don't have jurisdiction here and you can't do that. But yet the Cardassians essentially do the same thing, and that's no big deal. Yeah, it's... Amazing that they're not making more of a show of strength. Wouldn't you want to send most of the fleet there? Where does the Federation draw the line? Yeah, I... Yeah. <laughs> they haven't invaded all the Federation space. Yeah, I think they only do a big show of force when it's important to the story. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, one of those. I had to go back and look up the Set Like 3 reference yes. and what that was. And this was... A massacre that didn't happen on screen, but it happened as part of a story on Next Gen. Oh, it goes all the way back there. Yeah, it was in an episode. I Shoot, I can't remember. I just watched it yesterday. I think it was called The Wounded. And Miles meets up with an old captain of his from the Rutledge, which he's talked about oh, before. And yeah. they had served together in that border war, which we mostly hear about and don't see. And uh, during that war, this settlement, Setlik 3 was attacked by Cardassians and all these civilians were killed, including Miles's captain's family. Yeah. And so that was the reference to that. But also, I think a lot of the people were held prisoner and then tortured. And that's where Miles gets a lot of his information gotcha. about what Cardassians do. Yeah, that's an interesting episode. It also shows the complete moral bankruptcy of the Federation. <laughs> it also has Gul Dukat in it, except he's not Gul Dukat. He's a different Cardassian. Oh. And my theory about that is that Gulder Cat was actually pretending to be a different Cardassian. Well, he wasn't quite the same. He did appear to be a little bit more reasonable, and he found some common ground with Picard, which was very interesting. And also, Picard made a bit of a threat to him at the end when he was letting him know that, again, just like what you're saying, that the Federation was now aware that the Cardassians were shipping weapons around and getting it near Federation territory, even though they weren't supposed to be doing that. Oh, yes. But that's all they do. Picard put on a very stern face. He was going to write a serious letter to the Cardassians. <laughs> they really, yeah. it makes me laugh because I feel that the Federation completely lacks understanding of who and what they are dealing with. But that's so next gen. Yeah. The I will rise above it. I will show you that we have a better way. That was the whole thing that's about true. next that, gen. That's very true. Well, we've wandered into a whole other show, so let's come back to this episode. Yes. Makbar calls the station to say that she's representing the Cardassian Empire in the case against Miles. She won't allow anyone to see him, but says he's being treated with care and respect. Sisko says, if he's not, I will hold you personally responsible. Oh. If that sounds like a threat, it is. <laughs> really? That doesn't even sound like a threat. You're going to hold me responsible? Well, Sisko might do something. Oh. Picard would write a letter. Well... Yes, he's going to write a very serious letter and give Cardassia a negative rating on TripAdvisor. <laughs> oh my God. This is where no I stars. say the Federation just seems utterly unaware of what the Cardassians are and how they think. But also at this point, they don't know if Miles maybe did something. Oh, that's true. But still, they picked him up in Federation territory. And yeah, they don't do anything to point out you're violating the treaty. Nothing. And it's a Federation citizen. Right. Well, she continues on and she, of course, does not say what he's charged with. So we still don't know. The charges will be announced at the trial. 
Yeah, and she says he's already been found guilty, so there's really no reason to prepare for the trial, which is great. <laughs> the wife is allowed to attend, but no one else. Odo says he's an officer of the Cardassian court and requests that he be appointed as his Nestor or advisor. She agrees and says, Miles' execution is scheduled for next week. And then she hangs up. So he's guilty and the execution is scheduled, but we're going to have a trial. I feel Odo really outflanked her here. She was unaware he was designated as an officer of the Cardassian court. Right. I think they lack the research here of looking at all the possibilities. And they know Odo well, is on the station and worked for the Cardassian Empire. But they might not view this as a danger because I think yeah. they have viewed Odo as being on the Cardassian side. Oh, that's true. The way Odo could actually call and talk to Gul Dukat. Right. That he sees Odo as, mm, I wouldn't say friendly, but... No. No, he sees him more as impartial. He doesn't see him as a threat in any way. Yeah. But yeah, I liked how Odo managed to do that. Yes. And it's a good thing he did. Odo and Keiko head out together while Cisco calls for a complete security sweep of the station to identify all of Miles' recent activity. Kira points out that O'Brien hates the Cardassians. Maybe he really has done something. And Cisco says, well, we need to know that too. Yeah, I like that he tasked Kira with finding out what Miles was up to. This is the second time in two episodes that we've seen Kira tasked with basically finding the truth. Kira has this sense of duty, even if the results are negative. She'll still do her job. Well, we had the Odo Mysteries, and now we have Kira, Bajoran Detective. Oh, I like the sound of that series. That was a good show. So we have the Odo Mysteries, Kira, Bajoran Detective, and... Yep. Inappropriate conversations with Dax. <laughs> well, that's more of a podcast, I think. That would be a good podcast. <laughs> Odo would have the Odo Mysteries on Hallmark Mysteries or whatever that channel is. Oh, yeah. So before we go into the ad break, I'll bring up one final thing in this scene. So mm -hmm. the Cardassians have basically admitted to kidnapping a Federation citizen and yep. are now planning to execute him and actually have a date scheduled for executing. How far do they have to go? Yeah. <laughs> Before the Federation will do something. Yeah. Yeah. I, how far does anybody have to go? I mean, isn't this basically an act of war? I feel like, just like in that Next Gen episode that I watched, yeah. it was always really important to Picard to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when your number one priority is to keep the peace, you do sometimes end up getting stepped on. Yeah. But you have to be willing to step up when something like this happens because you you can't be a pushover. You have to show that you are capable of upholding your part of an agreement yeah. and that you're also capable of fighting back. Otherwise, you just get pushed around by bullies. And as we covered when Atiba was on the show with us a couple of weeks ago, the Cardassians are just bullies. Right. I, somebody should explain to the Federation there's a word for what they're doing and it's called appeasement and it doesn't work out yeah. historically very well. Right. It's not good. Well, we're back on Cardassia Prime, and now we meet Conservator Kovat, who is Miles' public defendant. He says his job is to help him concede to the wisdom of the state, wow. to accept the inevitable with equanimity, which Miles found very amusing. I had to look that word up, but it means remaining calm in a difficult <laughs> situation. I don't know. I hadn't heard that word, at least maybe not in a long time. There is so much in this scene that is just great. It's a fantastic insight into not only the Cardassian legal system, but their whole way of thinking. Yes. Kovat says, there's an old Cardassian expression, confession is good for the soul, but it's also good for the populace to see someone like you confess. It makes them feel better about themselves. Oh, wow. Yeah. The point of the trial is not to get to any kind of truth, but to demonstrate the futility of behavior contrary to good order. So basically to prove there's punishment for doing things that the state doesn't like. Right. This guy is really good. He says that this shows Cardassians that all criminals are punished and all endings are happy. <laughs> <laughs> He's just really good. Oh, yeah. The way he delivers it is just so smooth as well, as if this is completely normal. This is just the way things are. Well, he's been doing this his whole yeah. career, and he, he is an older guy. Later on, he says he's only one year from retirement. Kovat is played by a guy named Fritz Weaver, who was born in 1926. Wow. He was in all kinds of stuff, including Hawaii Five-0, Ironside, The yeah. Man from Uncle, oh, gosh. Uh, Rawhide, Gunsmoke, <laughs> many, many things. And he's really good here. So he really is a fixture of classic television. 
For sure. And when we get to the courtroom scenes, you see that sort of melodrama come out yeah. of him. Oh, very He's much a so. very colorful yeah. character and a very colorful actor. And he delivers so many great lines in this scene. When Miles asks him, what am I being charged with? And he replies, yeah. no need to worry about that at the moment. It's like, what? <laughs> this is the whole point. Yeah. I kept wanting Miles to say, when do I worry about that? Because they kept telling him, oh, now's not the time. Yes. It's like, when is the time? Right before you kill me? But you also learn as well that apparently the Cardassian people do enjoy a good show trial. It's sort of a public spectacle. It's all about the show. Yeah. It's almost like Cardassian reality TV. It is. It's exactly what yeah. it is. And it's part of that propaganda television yeah. that they've got going 24-7 outside in the city. What was the other line? The... Um, Oh, it's to help the guilty concede to the wisdom of the state. Yes. I mean, that's fascinating yep. because this totally ties back to, oh gosh, four episodes ago where Garrick loaned one of the greatest Cardassian novels, in his opinion, to Bashir. And it was just about repeating selfless service to the state. And then the next <laughs> right. generation comes along and does the same yeah. thing. There's like nine generations of that or something. Yeah. And Garrick is like, isn't that brilliant? It's fascinating how much this shows just the Cardassian mindset that's been, if you like, programmed into them. Yes, indoctrinated at a young age, right. I should imagine. I'm going to speculate here that I think they ordered some of the episodes incorrectly. Profit and loss should have come after this, because this would have made the impact, I think, of profit and loss much greater. The fact that you had Cardassians who were thinking differently from the state. And this episode helps really build that repressive nature. The state isn't wrong. You're wrong. So you see what I mean? Yes, I see what you're saying. We're back on the station and we have bad news. We found that someone transported two dozen photon warheads off the station by doing a tricky transporter switcheroo and somehow fooling the sensors, which, okay. They have sensors? It had the same weight. It's like <laughs> you couldn't tell it was different. They swapped like a bunch of metal into the boxes where the warheads were supposed to be and nobody noticed. Well, yeah, I was wondering why Dax was standing scanning a dumpster when it started. Yes, yeah, she was. Well, according to the security logs, Miles was in this weapons locker right before he left. The computer let him in because of his voice print, which is why voice prints are not secure because you can just record somebody's voice and then use it. So let me get this straight. They don't have two-person authentication for unscheduled access into the weapons locker right? where they keep photon warheads. Well, they should at least have multi-factor authentication. They should have the two-person rule should be the minimum, yeah. as well as having a permanent guard. Uh, yeah. Security on the station is so lax. It wouldn't matter if they weren't, if they didn't have a room full of photon warheads. Right. It wouldn't matter as much, but I mean, come on. <laughs> That's what I mean, why it was so funny that not only did someone get in there, that was bad enough, just using a recording of Miles' voice, but then they were able to do a transport of the weapons right. off the station and put some metal into the same box and somehow nobody noticed. I mean, it's ridiculous. Although they do say that you'd have to be really good with the transporter to make this happen, like Miles. Yeah. So that's convenient. Well, Cisco wants a full analysis of the voice print to make sure it was really Miles, which, thank goodness, somebody does that. Bashir says it makes no sense for Miles to take warheads on his vacation, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Yes. But it is the kind of thing Miles might do so he could tinker on them, like maybe they needed to be fixed or something and he was going to, you know, work on them. <laughs> I'll take a load of warheads on vacation because, yeah, the guidance yeah. system's needing upgrading and I, I was just going to reflash the firmware. Exactly. But Kira says... He could have taken them to rendezvous with someone with the Maquis. Dax and Cisco wonder how the Cardassians even knew to check Miles' runabout for the warheads. They obviously had some kind of inside yeah. info. Cisco says he'll have Starfleet pick up some Maquis to try and figure out who was supposed to be on the receiving end of the warheads. Also, he wants to identify any Maquis who may have been on the station recently. So he sets out quite the action plan there. Yeah, when... You have to do something. Cisco's on it. He's always got the plan. Yeah. He's always get, you know, he's always ready to give everybody orders and get people moving. I like that. That is one thing we do seem to see a lot of here with Cisco and I do like it. I mean not just this scene but this season. We see a lot more yeah. of the Cisco being able to plan and think on his feet. Man of action. Yeah, he's received all these sources of information, all these various things are coming in, and he can quickly put together a plan and assign it and start to execute it. But he also knows he doesn't have much time. Yeah. The trial is in two days. The execution is next week. You're going to have to get moving. Right. Well, Odo arrives in Miles' cell. 
Miles tells him about the tooth they took, and Odo says all Cardassians are required to give the Bureau of Identification one of their first molars. It's usually extracted at age 10, which didn't make a ton of sense here because he's not a Cardassian. So that didn't really explain why they did it, but it became important information later. They just like a molar. Yeah. They have a thing about dentistry. Odo tells Miles that Keiko is also there. The families are always invited to execution so that the public can see them weep, which is, (laughs) wow, dramatic. The Cardassians do like a good execution, don't they? Well, they like any kind of show. That's the whole thing. It really is. It's a show trial, a show execution, show the people. It's reality TV at its worst. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, it's a little bit like The Hunger Games. <laughs> that's that, that's true, yeah. Odo doesn't know the formal charges. Of course, we still don't know. Yep. But he starts asking Miles if he knows anyone in the Maquis or if he's ever supplied them with weapons. Miles vehemently denies it all, of course. Odo tells him about the missing warheads and about the voice recording releasing the security lock on the weapons locker. Miles says, you don't know me very well, Odo, but I've been in service to the Federation, to Starfleet, all my adult life. No one has ever questioned my loyalty. No one in my entire life has had cause to ask me if I was a criminal. I took an oath to defend the Federation. I'm no angel, but I live every day as the best human being I can be. I need my little girl to look at me as someone who she can respect, and until now, she always could. Odo softens considerably after this speech, saying, Being accused of a crime is not a disgrace. Some of the great figures of history share that honor. He says not all of them were martyrs, and not all of them died. Some of them were just innocent men, like you. Odo wants no weeping in the courtroom. He wants the Archon to see the clear, unwavering eyes of an innocent man. Miles thanks him for being there, and Odo leaves. Loved this scene. So good. Odo went into full interrogation mode. He didn't cut Miles any favors here. This scene was awesome. Yeah, Odo was being really rough on him because that's what Odo does, but he really quickly took to the speech that Miles gave and believed him and obviously felt that it was from the heart, which of course it was. We know Miles. This is a thing about Odo that we've seen multiple times. Odo is very good at spotting when people are lying or not telling the truth. He does have a very good sense of what's going on. I mean, Kira is one of the few people who's ever seems to be tricked him. Well, that's what he says, but we haven't seen a lot of it. We've just heard him, you know, mentioning that, that Kira was one person who was able to fool him. But yeah, if that's true, then he would have noticed that Miles was telling the truth. Yeah, he just doesn't cut him any slack. But what I really liked about it was he was in that sort of accusatory tone and was grilling him really hard and Miles, you know, never wavered. And then when he heard that story, he switched into this almost philosophical Odo which is a version of Odo we don't get to see very often, but I really liked it. So many times we just, especially in season one, it was just crotchety Odo, right? right? What the heck? But this scene, there was so much heart in it. That's the kind of stuff I really enjoy. And I want to feel a show when I watch it. And I felt this scene. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Miles gave basically his justification or his, his philosophy of life. Yes. And I believe... Miles thinks that, that he is the best human he can be every day. And he definitely has his flaws. There's no doubt about that. But that's very much a Federation principle. And it's very much a Star Trek principle as well. The idea of people wanting to be better. But it's so interesting if you go back to the episode called Cardassians, where Miles and Keiko had that Cardassian child in their quarters. Right, yeah even though he was really like a 30-year-old actor. But anyway. (laughs) Close enough. And in that scene where Miles said something kind of racist about the Cardassians, and Keiko just called him on it. And what was great about it was, now looking back, is that it stung Miles. And he didn't just like double down, which a lot of times people who are horrible will do. They will just say it twice as bad, or you know they'll stand behind it because they don't want to be wrong or they don't want to be shown up. How did she put it? You said something very ugly. Yes. And he did. He did say something ugly. And it, it almost doesn't even matter if it was true. It was ugly. And he was saying it in the presence of a kid who really didn't want to be a Cardassian already. It's like, you can't feed that. That poor kid. Yeah. He didn't know who he should be or who he should want to be. And Miles was just feeding that flame. And I just like that she called him and he was like, oh, okay." Well, and it changed his opinion. It did. At least about the kid. Well, he was willing to talk to the kid after that and listen to him and hear what he wanted and not just assume that he knew. You know, we don't 
really learn a lot about Miles in Next Gen. No. He's a side character who kind of comes and goes. He's got a lot more screen time here and is better developed here. But in that episode, The Wounded, he's sitting in 10 forward. Yeah. And one of the Cardassians who's on board, because they have these liaisons on board, he's sitting in a bar with this Cardassian. The Cardassian had tried to talk to him before and say, hey, I'd like to learn about your transporters. You know, he was trying to kind of build a relationship with Miles. And Miles was just like, get off of me. And was really rude to him. He was trying to steal Federation transporter technology, obviously. But he, that's that wasn't why Miles was upset. Okay, that was a, it was a different thing. Because he <laughs> could have said that. He could have just said, hey, I'm not allowed to talk about it. He could have done that, but he didn't. Because that guy could have just been trying to make an inroad. If it was a normal human, they, he could have just been trying to find some common ground. Yeah. That's what you do. That's how you build relationships with people you don't know. But what Miles says in that scene is I don't hate Cardassians. I hate what Cardassians made me become because he had to kill someone in the war. Yeah. And that's a really interesting way to look at it. But he is still, because he calls Cardassians Cardies and because he automatically assumes that the Cardassians are evil, which who knows, maybe they are. It's sci-fi. But because he is always jumping to that conclusion, he's got that problem with them. Even though he says, no, I don't hate Cardassians. I hate what you made me be. It's like the Cardassians didn't make you a racist. You made yourself do that, even though this happened during the war. That guy he's sitting with in the bar had nothing to do with it. And that guy was actually, he talked about it and said, we were wrong. We shouldn't have done that. We had bad yeah. info. So he was even being kind of human about it. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I get what you mean. I don't know what word to use when he's a Cardassian, but you know, <laughs> if it was a person on Earth, I would just mean he, he's showing that he is vulnerable, I guess. I think the only problem, and we might be getting into analyzing a different show here, I think the only problem with that is from what we've learned with the Cardassians here is that is more likely to be a complete head fake. That's a deliberate, very cynical way of them getting information from the Federation. I mean, it could have been, but also it might not have been. It was next gen. Yeah. It's what I liked about next gen is that when stuff like that happened, where it was a fake or somebody was actually evil and, you know, pretending to be something else or whatever. Oh, they would be found out. It was more the rarity and it would be found out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because it wasn't, there was never this long arc story like what we've got going on here or on, you know, more modern shows. Yeah. On this show, it definitely would have been a fake and it would have shown the Cardassians to be, this is their standard operating procedure. Well, I think the difference in Next Gen was, Next Gen was much more about the development of the people on the ship and the development yeah. of the people in the Federation. And it really wasn't about anybody else. It was confined yeah. to that set of people. This show is not like that. I think in the beginning, they were struggling a little bit to figure out who they were. Mm -hmm. But they've realized that if they expand their universe kind of outside of the, I don't want to call it a gas station, because I actually think it's much more like a strip mall now than a gas station. <laughs> but if they want to expand outside of it, then they have to develop these outside right. characters. The thing is, though, they can't always just be evil, because that is just dull. They have to be nuanced. Well, that's certainly what we've seen with the Cardassians. There have been, there's a movement within Cardassia that wants to change. Well, this is probably why they showed profit and loss first. Mm -hmm. Because you know that going in. That's a good point. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that till just now. All right, let's, we should probably keep going. Moving back to the episode. <laughs> back on the station, Dax has figured out that Miles' voice print was actually a manipulated recording. Kira comes in saying she figured out the Maquis who was on the station the day Miles left, and people saw him talking to Miles on the promenade. Cisco says he'll have this guy picked up. Of course, that was Boone, the badly dressed guy. Well, that mustache just proved his guilt right out the gate. <laughs> I think somebody like that is easier to remember, too. That mustache was hard to forget. <laughs> and he had these piercing eyes, and then he had that hideous outfit. Yes. That guy was quite memorable. Well, the trial is starting, and we see the Archon announcing the start of the trial, and people standing outside watching the broadcast. I mean, it's like three Cardassians in uniform, so it's not like big crowds of people. <laughs> but I think we're supposed to think everyone on Cardassia is watching. Yeah, that's a big crowd in Cardassia. Miles has been found guilty of aiding and abetting seditious acts against the state. This courtroom is comically dark with <laughs> very heavy shadows everywhere. You can actually barely even see anything yeah. or anyone who's in the scene. Well, and that ties back to Garrick saying about how he thought the station was always too bright. The Cardassians kind of like the darkness. Oh, right. I forgot about that. 
They ask Miles to confess, but he says, no thanks. Then they give Keiko the opportunity to disassociate herself from her criminal <laughs> husband, but she also declines. Oh, man. you got to love Cardassian law. But also, I kind of like that they do that because they're, if you get into that situation and you know you have no chance, that person is going to be executed. Yeah. You may as well at that point free yourself from it so that you are no, you're not going to be accused of that same crime or you're not going to be accused as being attached to that person in some way or what is the word I'm looking for? Um, guilty by association. Yeah. It also fits perfectly for Cardassian law. Absolutely. The actress playing the Archon, she just has the scariest eyes. Yeah. I, I can understand it because she must have such little ability to actually do any facial acting because... And she can't even really move her head. Right. So the only yeah. thing she can really work with there is her eyes and the way she just does completely crazy eyes when she's reading these <laughs> over-the-top, almost melodramatic statements and things. She reminded me of Ducat a few times. Yes. She's doing a great job of deliberately making this overly dramatic. Clearly, yeah, to she, that's the, the sort of the show trial aspect and the reality TV aspect of Cardassian justice. Well, Odo causes a little chaos by breaking the rules of the court. The Archon points out that all of Cardassia is watching and she wants to put on a good show. <laughs> the Conservator is very annoyed that Odo is making him look bad yeah. when he's only a year away from retirement, which was a cute little touch. Yeah, he has to be relieved of this assignment. Yes, and she's like, no, sit down. I feel bad for him. Clearly, he has a nice little niche market of helping people admit they're guilty, and he just wants a quiet life. His job is acting. Oh, he yes. puts on a dramatic play yep. and he's very happy to do it because he's very melodramatic. And then his person loses and he goes on to the next case. And he's very happy because he thinks this is helping the state. Yeah, that's true. I play a lawyer on Cardassian television. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so true. <laughs> Odo says they have new evidence to prove that Miles is innocent, but the conservator doesn't care because you can't present new evidence after the verdict has already been made. <laughs> Then he wants to move the venue of the trial because no crime was committed against Cardassia. Yes. The Archon tells Odo that he won't like the punishment for contempt of court. And Odo very calmly says he regrets that he has no teeth to offer the Bureau of Identification. Burn. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great line. That was a, that was a good dig. Well, at any rate, she doesn't care about new evidence. She's sure it would all be fabricated by the Federation anyway. Oh, yes. What's with the weird little either gallery or is that the jury or something? <laughs> I don't know. Those three guys who were like tapping their fingers on the chair. I don't know who they were. That's what I mean. It was too dark. Yeah. And one of them's obviously a child. Mm hmm. I know exactly. The whole thing was so strange. I guess they probably either are the observers or the jury who are there to ensure that Cardassian law is carried out. Well, they did nothing. So I wondered if you could like win a seat on set. Oh, oh, this is like, yeah, they, they want to, they want a radio show competition. They want, exactly. They want a radio call-in show and the whole family got to go and just sit there in the dark <laughs> and watch this unfold. Watch justice being faked. Because they didn't do anything. It, there was just that one scene where they were like tapping their fingers on the chair and that could have been nothing. That could have just been the actors tapping their fingers. I don't know. The whole thing was weird. <laughs> I think it's the Cardassian equivalent of clapping. Oh, Maybe. Back on the station, we've picked up Boone and his mustache. He's still in the same ugly outfit, so that guy only got one outfit to appear on the show. He denies having done anything wrong, of course. Naturally. Sisko says they won't turn him over to the Cardassians, but that doesn't sway him at all. And they're curious why he seems so dispassionate about this whole thing, and he doesn't seem to care about his old comrade at all. Bashir enters medical, and none of his lights work. I think it's medical. I don't think it was his yeah, it orders was because they were... Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, it's dark. And that's because someone has come to deliver a message without being seen. From the shadows, someone behind him says, Boone isn't a member of the Maquis. He says we knew nothing of the theft, and he's not one of us. Oh, the mystery deepens. Yes. I was wondering if it was going to be Garrick. You know, because Garrick likes to turn the lights off. That's true, but it was definitely not Garrick. Oh, that's true. Garrick likes to be creepy. Like, wake Bashir up. <laughs> exactly. And Garrick sitting at yeah. the end of his bed. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have worded it as a question, because that's always what he does. Oh. He never just says anything. Do you think Boone was with us? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Back at the trial, Gull Evek is now talking about finding the photon warheads in the runabout and saying the Maquis want to kill Cardassians. He has reliable sources that have said the warheads were meant for the Maquis. Reliable sources. 
Well, Oda wants to know who the reliable sources are, but Yvek says, it's a risk to national security to reveal their names. And the Archon says, oh, well, that's good enough for me. It was so awesome. <laughs> yes. And she tells Odo to stop talking, saying this is already the longest trial in Cardassian history. <laughs> oh, that was great. I mean, yeah, but the ratings would be good. This would be good for TV. Yes, it's showing that justice by the state can be done. Now we go back to the station. We're flopping back and forth a lot. Oh, yeah. They force Boone to have a medical examination. They want to understand why he hasn't spoken to his parents in eight years and why he left his wife eight years ago. Yeah, there are a lot of odd facts that just don't add up. Well, yeah, and it all happened after he was discharged from Starfleet, after the events on Setlick 3. Yep. Then they force him into a chair and Bashir comes at him with a hypo spray, a little like what they did to Miles earlier, which was interesting. I guess they are kind of showing the difference in approach between the Cardassians and the Federation. Yeah, they don't beat him up exactly. Yeah, they're interrogating him and they're using minimal force, I would say. Yeah. Rather than the Cardassians who start with maximum force and then back off True. when ordered to. But also, he didn't really resist. But, well, I guess he did. He kind of ran. He tried to run off. Yeah. But it kind of bookended the story. Yeah. They didn't actually torture him. No, they didn't. They didn't. Back at the trial, Miles is trying to convince Keiko not to come to the execution when the Archon comes in and resumes the proceedings. They put Miles on the stand, and his conservator tells Odo that now is the time to make Miles confess. <laughs> Think of the children. <laughs> Allow them to see a glimmer of enlightenment as the offender realizes the end is near. This is what I mean about him being so dramatic, oh, yeah. and he's totally an actor. And Odo is like, no thanks. And you know there'll be a close-up camera on him talking to Odo doing that. Oh, for sure. Then Kovat starts asking Miles questions, trying to show why he's a criminal. Like, were you abused as a child? Or maybe your wife caused you psychological stress? Nope. <laughs> Miles <laughs> is not helping. <laughs> he says he's trying to establish why a fine man like Miles turned into a criminal. And then he says to Miles, maybe you can help me. Nope. Miles says again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Miles in the dock says, I'm not a criminal. Okay, Kovat says, I tried. This poor guy, his whole world is upside down. Yeah, he just shrugs his shoulders and walks off. Yeah. This isn't in the script. Well, then the Archon steps in and she asks Miles, how many Cardassians have you killed? None, Miles says. Well, not since the war. She says, including the war. And Miles says he's not sure. It was war. And then she asks him if he has a warm place in his heart for his Cardassian neighbors, or does he hate them? I thought that was an interesting turn <laughs> yeah. of phrase. I'm not sure I have a warm place in my heart for the Cardassians. Haven't you publicly stated your opposition to the treaty and said the bloody Cardis can't be trusted? That does sound like Miles. And I think that's a statement of fact, so... He tries to avoid that question, but he is compelled to say it's true. I think Miles is clearly more of a realist than the rest of the Federation combined. Kovat then says, it's obvious he's guilty and we have no choice but to concede. Miles says he does not concede. Kovat apologizes, saying he's lost control. No matter, the judge says, you've done your usual eloquent job. Then the door opens and in comes Cisco with the mustache guy. Things shift radically all of a sudden as the Archon says, once again, the Cardassian system of jurisprudence has worked to protect its people. By the way, never before has a show used the word jurisprudence so many times in 46 <laughs> minutes. I only wrote it down once, but they said it like 10 times. Yeah, she has been caught a little flat-footed. She says a guilty man has been brought to justice, but never let it be said that there is no room in the system for compassion. I sense in Mr. O'Brien the potential for rehabilitation, and I'm sure he has gained a new appreciation for Cardassian law. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I am pleased in the spirit of furthering Cardassian Federation relations to hereby set aside the verdict and release Mr. O'Brien into the custody of his commander, Benjamin Sisko. Everyone is happy except for Kovat, who asks Odo, what happened? <laughs> and Odo says, you won, <laughs> Poor which has never happened before. And Kovat says, they'll kill me as everyone leaves the courtroom. They probably will. Poor guy. Like you said, he just wanted a quiet life and to follow the script. Yep. He just wanted to do a couple more runs in this play and then retire. Exactly. Now we're on the runabout going back to the station. And Cisco says Dr. Bashir confirmed that Boone was missing his first molar. And DNA analysis confirmed that he was actually a Cardassian who was surgically altered eight years ago oh. to replace the real Boone who died at Setlick 3. So he's been a spy for eight years. This is kind of interesting because this points to events that happen on Voyager. So 
this is setting a groundwork for something that happens in a later series, which I kind of like. Well, but also it's a plot point in season one of Discovery. Yeah. And one of the things that people criticized it for and saying it's not realistic, it's not Star Trek. But guess what happens all over the place in Star Trek? Um, the Tribbles episode? <sighs> <sighs> I don't know what else to say. Okay, Karen. Well, Keiko wonders why they would want to frame Miles, but Odo says it was never really about Miles. It was intended to discredit the Federation and show that they were supporting the Maquis. Next, they would have demanded that the colonies be removed from their territory. Sisko says when the Archon saw Boone, she realized we had the goods to discredit them in front of the entire populace, which is the risk of doing live television. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was a really high risk game, though, overall, because there's always so many secrets amongst the Cardassian officials. I mean, how did he know that the Archon would recognize this guy so quickly? Yeah, she was obviously in on it. Well, clearly, yes. I guess maybe he figured because she was associated with Gul Dukat because she mentions him earlier. Right. Well, Miles wants to get back to work, but Cisco says he extended his vacation and they're going to drop him off at the lagoon, whatever that was. And then, haha, we all laugh. The end. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a very abrupt ending. Yeah. I guess that they were really pushed for time on this one. Yeah, I suppose they were. Because they crammed a lot in. There was not a lot of dead air time on this show. No. And when they brought in Boone, the judge immediately was like, oh, la la, everything's fine. He's free to go. And it's like, bloom, and we're over. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we've reached the end of the episode. Do you have any over analysis other than all the over analysis we've already done? Why? Well, yes, I do. I still have more. Okay. Well, the first one is, please get some security on the weapons locker. That's more <laughs> of an observation. Yeah. Just, we talked about that earlier, but just please do it. Man, and get some security on Miles. Uh, it sounds like he, he needs some. He keeps getting kidnapped and arrested and... Yeah, he has a, yeah, he has a pretty rough time. Bad. Yeah. Next one. Now, this is something about the Cardassians from what we've seen in this episode. I would have thought that... The judge, certainly from a better face-saving perspective, mm -hmm. would have just announced that, oh, the trial is over. Miles was found guilty. We're all done here. And then just given him to Cisco. So literally just announced that, oh, the trial is over. Everybody did a good job. The end. But the execution is also public. So she would have had to explain why there was no execution. They just wouldn't have been the execution. And you would have never mentioned again why there wasn't one. And I have the feeling the Cardassians aren't really into asking questions about Explaining why the things. state did or didn't do something. But it would have been like the cliffhanger that never had the next season. Oh. I keep thinking about this as a TV show. But it would have been less embarrassing <laughs> because I have the feeling that nobody in Cardassian legal history has actually ever been found no. innocent. No, because they're already guilty when they go into the trial. Exactly. So yeah. just declaring the trial is at an end. And moving on would, you know, maintain that perfect record. Well, I wonder if she got in trouble for doing that. Oh, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Because I don't think we ever see her again. Uh -huh. She may have gone off with Kovat. Yeah. They get rid of both of them. Right. I mean, I don't know what choice she had, really. She could have done what you're proposing. Tragic transporter accident. I guess it, yeah, right. But I guess it would have depended on whether or not they felt like they gained something from her saying, in the spirit of extending our relations yes. with the Federation, you know, I, I don't know if there was any good in that. Maybe there was. Yeah. Used it for political points with right. the Federation. She should have said something about the children. Doing it for the children. That was a big thing in this episode. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, we saw two direct references to, you know, basically think of the children. Yes. Okay. That's, that's a good point. I like that. Man, this station's in a dangerous place. It really is. <laughs> We're too close to the Cardassians. <laughs> They're just picking us off one by one. Far too close to the Cardassians. <laughs> Ugh, I don't like it here. <laughs> dangerous. Well, clearly this episode is heavily influenced by Franz Kafka and the trial. It felt very much like that was used as a basis for writing this show. And hmm. this episode, I think, works great with that. They've taken the concept and moved it into a science fiction setting and in Star Trek. Definitely, definitely works. Right. Also, so do you think Miles was specifically picked out because he has a known dislike for Cardassians? He's not terribly subtle. Well... <sighs> I don't know. That was kind of my over analysis question was, how did Miles get embroiled in this? Because that guy who he bumped into yeah. 
was that the point? Did he go to the station to try to bump into him to get a recording in order to get, I mean, yes. was that the whole plan? Because it almost seemed like an accident. Yeah, I think it was, that was very much planned. And then that's why they picked him, I suppose, yeah. because he could easily have a conversation with him. Again, a high risk game, though. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what they were trying for. So, yeah, I think you're right that perhaps the, it was Miles because they had someone that they could actually use to get close to Miles and get the recording and right. rather than specifically picking Miles. Because I was thinking about Undiscovered Country, where they have the recording of Kirk, which they play it as Klingon trial, oh, yeah. where he says he, right. he doesn't trust the Klingons. He'd never trust the Klingons. Might be paraphrasing there. And so they were tr this was a similar thing with Miles of somebody who you, you had witnesses who could testify to him saying bloody cardies can't be trusted. <laughs> but you're right. Yeah, I think that's it's more likely that it was because of Boone and they could use him. OK, right. The reference to Goldu Cat earlier by the Archon. I'm assuming that was a direct pointer to this was a Goldu Cat scheme that she was in on or she was a co-conspirator. Because I think he's completely behind this. Well, he's behind everything, so. <laughs> Almost But I wonder what she meant, too, because he made a threat, and then she was like, oh, Gul Dukat told me all about you. And I, the last time we saw Gul Dukat, he said that Cisco was pretty lame. Yeah. Because he wasn't willing to shoot at the Maquis. Well, I think in Gul Dukat's terms, he would class Cisco as lame, but also a threat. Because oh. Cisco is smart and is also, you know, stands up for his principles, etc. He can't be bullied by Ducat. That's true. And Cisco did save his life. Yeah. He could be nice to him once. <laughs> but yeah, I think the <laughs> out of character. But yeah, I think the reference to Ducat was a point at that this was his plan, she was working with him. Right. And that leads on to my final point. So Given that this is the latest maneuvering against the Federation colonists, and yes. this was now a plot you know, not only against Miles to have him executed, but also a plan to discredit the treaty and the settlers and basically forcibly evacuate them or deport yep. them. At what point do the Federation realize their piece of paper treaty is not worth it's the garbage. digital pad it was written on? I don't know. They're planning on how they can basically throw out the Federation citizens. You have to wake up at some point and go, you know, I don't think they're playing by the same rules we are. Maybe they should send some more ships to the DMZ, to the edge of the DMZ, and have them shake their fists through the observation windows at the Cardassians to show how upset they are. I don't know. I feel like this is a frustration we have with a lot of things today. It's sort of the way we fight terrorists because we don't want to do the same thing that the terrorists do. And so you end up trying to, I don't know, shame them or something, which just doesn't work. So I don't know. I, I find this topic kind of frustrating because I understand maybe this is a thing I don't like about this show because I under, I more understand the way that Next Gen handles yeah. it where they're just trying to show me, see, we're better. <laughs> <laughs> and we just move on. The story just moves on yeah. to the next episode yeah. and we just forget all about that. Whereas now we're kind of stuck with this problem right. and we need to do something. We need to be better. I mean, it's even like when you go back to the episode duet, I found that very frustrating that our stance there was, oh, well. He was a criminal <laughs> like, who killed oh, lots of people, but you know, <laughs> they weren't Federation citizens. Oh, and even yeah. if they were Federation citizens, they're not people we care about. <laughs> I suppose it's part of the value of this kind of story yeah. is that this is the nuance. Things aren't black and white. We have to find ways through the shades of gray. Yeah. And typically, that's not the way Starfleet operates. Yep. Starfleet operates very much in the black and white world. Oh, very, yeah. Very, traditionally, yeah. very much so, agreed. Oh, and I think my final, final point. <laughs> I thought we already had a final point. This is the final, final point. <laughs> okay, okay. All but right. I think this episode really spells out just the completely oppressive nature of Cardassian society and yeah. the absolute superiority of the state over everything else in society. Or the state almost being society and everyone else is lesser. And with that final, final point, I think that wraps it up for me. Okay. I don't have any other over analysis. My women in the future section is short, but the women played their parts here, which is honestly all I asked for. 
Dax was unraveling the science. Scanning a Kira dumpster. was suspicious that Miles was really guilty, which is all very normal and logical. And that judge was great. She was calm. She was terrifying at the same oh, time. Yeah. She was very, very good. At the ice thing just got me. I, that was the <laughs> melodrama was fabulous. She's a little like that Klingon with the crazy eyes, Gauron. Yes, I think his oh, name was. Yes, that, you're she right. did look a little bit like that. Not quite as crazed, yeah. but still something that you're drawn to when you see it. Definitely. And I think what helped as well was the fact that she was playing someone who was putting on melodrama. So yeah. it, it, the whole thing worked just beautifully. She was the star of a reality TV show. Yes. I was going to say I was quite happy to see a woman has risen to this high-ranking position. We haven't really seen that in Cardassia yeah. yet. All of the goals have been met. Yeah. I don't know if we'll see anything different. But then when you realize that all this really is is just melodrama on TV, it's like a soap opera. Yeah then maybe she really hasn't risen to any important ranks. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> She's just Judge Judy. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's a, that's oh a funny gosh. way of looking at it. Yeah. I'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. I think that's all that I have for women in the future. Something I want to ask for the women in the future. Is Cisco assigning Kira to do this investigation work? Yeah. Do you think that shows the building of... The relationship between the two? No, he's she's the first officer. That is her job. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is, is Cisco trusting her now? We saw that as one of the things in the end of season one. And now when something has to happen, well, Cisco goes straight to her. Well, he definitely trusts her more than he did in season one. Yeah. They have shown that they trust each other. She's shown that she goes out of her way to do what she's told to do and to be part of that team. Yeah. So there's no reason anymore for Cisco not to trust her. He had reason in the first handful of episodes, yeah. but he doesn't have that reason anymore. She is shown to be loyal to the cause, even though she will certainly vote Bajor before she votes anything. Yeah. But she's on this station to try to do the right thing, whatever the right thing happens to be. That's always a little cloudy here. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, I would agree. Well, then let's move on to rating. Okay. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral, what is your rating? Absolute thumbs up. Great episode. Very enjoyable, just an exploration of Cardassian thinking as as much as anything else and a chance for Miles to do some acting and also the relationship between Mars and Odo. That was another great scene. That was a great scene. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed this. Yeah, I give it a thumbs up as well. I agree it was a really good episode. There were some scenes that were great. Again, it was some really good guest stars who performed their jobs really well. Oh, yeah. I loved Kovat. He was fantastic. I yes. loved the Archon. She was great. I would describe Kovat as an amiable fellow. If ever there was one. <laughs> Thank you, Gold Ducat, for that line, which we will be stuck with forever. Indeed. Overall, great episode. Another great episode. We've had, what, I don't know, three in a row now? Yes. Yeah, that have been really, really good. So, And then I also had a little sneak peek of the next episode as well. So, yeah, all of a sudden we're doing well again. Right. Okay, that brings us to the end of Season 2, Episode 25. Come back next week for 26, the season finale. And Yay. then that will be followed by a mailbag wrap-up episode. In the meantime, if you'd like to tell us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, please email us at rebingeit at gmail.com. Also, you can tweet us at rebingeit and follow us on Twitter because I do spend some time live tweeting an episode that I'm watching for this podcast. Also, check us out on TalkThroughMedia.com. You can leave feedback for us there for individual episodes and listen to all of our other awesome podcasts. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it from me. <laughs> <laughs>